consequential matters. So in the case of Ahmed Wale, we are operating on that assumption. That is why every now and then, when I speak to um, my then colleague, the Interior Minister, I want to find out, have you gotten to the bottom of it? This is a matter that we should be able to deal with and find the perpetrators and bring them to book, like was done in the case of um, uh, Kwabna Inning in the Ashanti region. It helps us to punish those who are responsible, prevent such acts from happening another time, and to put the record in its proper context. Abeti, for example, I met with him. I may not say some of these things publicly until I'm asked here. I met, I, I, I invited him, his chief executive, Mr. Kwabna DC, and himself, I met with him, spoke with him, I spoke to the regional police commander about whether or not safety mechanisms have been put in place for him to return uh, at that time, at the heat of the crisis, and what mechanisms were being made to ensure that uh, he was safe, even when he was here in Accra. I met with him here um, in Accra. Um, if you take um, my, my brother Manasseh, for example, it gets a bit controversial, because the information that's available to me at the time was that he reported that his life was in danger. The National Security Minister assisted for us to provide him with a police officer of his choosing to secure that. Later, the information I got was that he had left the country to take a break. He, to the best of my knowledge, never went on record to say he had gone into exile at the time. It was Professor Kwame Kakari of uh, who was formerly of the Media Foundation for West Africa, who in a public lecture then cited his travel and said that he had gone into exile because his life was in danger. Chairman, can I validate? Can you validate? I cannot. But I don't doubt him. I don't doubt him. The point I'm making is that we need to move the conversation from a point where it is he said, she said, and get to a point where a body that we all support can help us make progress in some of these conversations. Else, depending on where the shoe is, somebody will alert, somebody will deny. But if we are able to resource the NMC to execute this coordinated mechanism for the safety of journalists, we'll all be the better for it. Yeah, I promised I'll be here. I'll come to you. Yeah. Very well. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Honorable Kojo Okon Nkrumah, MP of Russia AV. Congratulations. You are still 38 years old. And will you be the youngest minister and minister of information? Yes. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Let's go to Chapter 12 again. Um, article 1624. It says editors and publishers of newspapers and other institutions of the mass media shall not be subject to control or interference by government, nor shall they be penalized or harassed for their editorial opinions and views or the content of their publications. Now, we see government in there, you speak for government. Would you say that this constitutional mandate has been complied with by President Kufaru's government and is being complied with? And why do you think that some sections of society uh, give out this perception that government is harassing the media? Well, I think that the Kufaru administration has complied with this constitutional provision um, and has been ensuring that we do not control or interfere with the work of editors and publishers, or that we do not penalize them or harass them for their editorial opinions and views or the content of their publications. Um, I think not only have we complied, but we have gone further to do other things that are aimed at enhancing access to information. I think earlier I spoke about the Right to Information Act, which was a bill that had come into this chamber for over 15 years, kept coming in and going. And on the watch of President Akufuadu, that bill has been passed into law. And today I'm happy to report to your committee the number of RTI requests that have come based on the infrastructure we've put in place and have been responded to. So not only have we complied with this, 
but we have gone further to do things that are aimed at expanding the frontiers. But it is true that there are lots of reports of attacks on journalists. That is true. And by the way, all of those reports are not necessarily coming from or um, uh, accusations at the doorstep of government. In fact, you recall that even in our recent elections, supporters of some parties that were not happy uh, you know, with some media houses participated. There are private organizations. You know, there are people whose money locked up at institutions. They take their you know, anger on the media. So various sectors of the Ghanaian community are indulging in this. And I think it contributes to the perception but, as I have said already, we need to put in place a mechanism that helps us to validate, that helps us to track, that helps us to sanction persons who are involved, because we need to protect the media. The media, the fourth estate of the realm, provides the sunlight that helps our democracy grow. Thank you. Now, we've heard about, as our colleagues talking about, one six four. Um, which is very critical under the freedom and independence of the media. The media doesn't have unfettered um, rights in um, pursuing its uh, vocation, but there should be laws which are reasonably required in the interest of national security, public order, morality, uh, for protecting reputations, rights, and freedoms of other persons. Now, do you think there are adequate laws to back this provision, especially for public morality and protecting rights and freedoms and reputations of persons? And I will tie in this with the ally which was uh, declared unconstitutional by the Supreme Court and what efforts have been made to ensure that it's cleaned up and brought back to this place. Indeed. I was a member of the, indeed I was the chairman of the Central Legislation Committee, which passed this LI, and I happened to be a member of the Media Commission too at that time. But the Supreme Court said it was unconstitutional. But I was thinking that with all these years, about four years now, we do see that we've worked adequately enough on these aspects to be able to um, enforce what is for. Chairman, so the first part of my answer is that, no, I don't think there are enough laws. There are still a lot of gray areas that need to be touched up, even including some of the ones you are mentioning about public morality. Um, secondly, the LI-2224, I believe, will be best grounded on a Broadcasting Act. Because in the absence of that Broadcasting Act, the LI my view respectfully is, 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 is hanging and you can't put something on nothing. And that is why I have mentioned earlier that one of the things we seek to do after the consultations we did in the last four years, sending the draft bill back to the various stakeholders and getting their input, um, we couldn't meet the cabinet timelines but what we are now poised to do is to be able to bring that broadcasting bill into this house, get the support of members, have it passed and then proceed to do an ally which should hopefully then have uh, an enabling legislation beneath it that can stand the test of time. Because I think part of the ruling in that case, uh, the Ghana Independent Broadcasters Association versus the Attorney General and National Media Commission, was that you could not, by legislative instrument, list out those sanctions that the NMC sought to put out for infractions. Any such sanctions will have to be contained in the proper um, bill, which becomes an act. That is assuming it is not unconstitutional in itself. And these are the parameters that we'll be working in, hopefully, if you approve me and I become minister. So the last one is about politicians who own media houses. There are several media houses, especially radio stations, who, which have ended up being owned by politicians or pseudo politicians or people fronting for politicians. What really do you think are the challenges in this area as far as this matter is concerned? So, Chairman, I think um, it's, it's, 
it's a position between two extremes. The Constitution gives all these freedoms, which allows everybody who qualifies and who can afford it, including politicians, to set up and own and operate media organizations. And I do not disagree with that. But on the South side as well, there are standards that must be met, including content standards. I think the, the, the real fear is that some politicians go very extreme, especially when they own media. And to cure that, what you need is a legislative framework that proscribes some things. If you have that, it doesn't matter who owns the station. Because it is actually possible that the politician does not own the station, but can do very dangerous things on the station. So respectfully, it is for me not about whether the politician is in ownership or not, though I agree it can give greater access and higher risk, but it is more importantly about setting the standards legally and the consequences thereof so that politician or not, owner or not, you don't go there. Yes. Um, so, so. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, Honorable nominee, in recent times, there are concerns over attacks on journalists, which has been raised over and over again. Uh, you have been seen to be condemning irresponsible journalism. Uh, more than attacks on journalists. Would you say irresponsible journalism is a reason for these attacks? Chairman, even before your committee, I have mentioned that even where journalists have committed some infractions, I believe that for many of them, it is not out of malice. It's probably because they have not benefited from the kind of training and standard setting that you would expect. So where journalists are involved in what you will call irresponsible journalism, what you will call irresponsible journalism, even that is not an excuse to attack journalists or to harass journalists. It's not an excuse. There are legally provided avenues which give room for when you feel that you have been offended by the work of a journalist to employ. But violence, harassment of journalists is unacceptable and should not take place. So I consistently make this point, and that is why we even went further to put in place this coordinated mechanism for the safety of journalists, and at the same time, the media capacity enhancement program, so that we can help those who may incur some infractions, uh, but through no fault of theirs, but at the same time, provide a framework that can help us protect um, a journalist. So if that is your position, um, then I think you should be worried about the closure of uh, the radio stations uh, that have been um, brought before this committee over and over again, particularly Radio Gold and Radio XYZ. Uh, the reason being that you have consistently said that we need to support journalists, we need to support them even in the face of infractions. In other words, we are given a purposive uh, approach a purposive interpretation the of the law. This house makes rules. And we say we should uh, support people who are breaching the rules. Please, let's move on to other things. No, uh, no, no, no. no. Uh, Mr. The Chairman, of no, my, Mr. Chairman my, we my made position. laws. Somebody has breached the law. No, Mr. Mr. Chairman, my position is that the, the minister is saying that even in the face of what is seen as irresponsible journalism, there are some of them which are not out of malice. So my point is that, so the radio stations that were closed down, was their infractions out of malice? Yes, I know. Chairman, I think my very good brother is putting the authorization expiration question in the same basket with irresponsible journalism. I think that the two are different. Um, I think irresponsible journalism, which he spoke to, if I understand him well, is about a journalist who in the line of his duty 
is not complying with the guidelines or the ethics of the Ghana Journalism Association or of journalism. Those ethics, I came with a copy of them here. It's a, it's a whole list that every journalist is trained. Don't do this, don't do this, don't do that. Those are the ones that I think if you breach, we are talking about irresponsible journalism. And what I'm saying is that even where that happens, you don't have the right to attack or to harass the journalist. I think that is very different from a media house that has elected to go for spectrum authorization and has flouted the terms, has been fined by the NMC, has gone to court, and the court has ruled against him. I think that the two are very different. Then, um, as a quick follow-up to that, in a very recent matter that uh, got my attention, there was a similar case where a journalist made certain statements that were not in good taste. And what happened? This journalist was not only arrested and kept beyond 48 hours. At the time he was at release, at the point of release, he was served with a contempt application. And this contempt was saying contempt of the judiciary, which was even unknown to the law. So my point is that there are things happening in the system that account for the reasons why the latest freedom, I mean, data on press freedom is ranking Ghana the 30th. And what would you do as a Minister of Information about these matters so that Ghana can, you know, re regain its place in the, you know, I mean, uh, in the international sphere? Chairman, I think in my examples before your committee, I have cited specific names, for example, that I was aware of and how I, quote-unquote, intervened in those situations. The incident that my good brother is talking about uh, has not been brought to my attention. I am unable to speak to it specifically. But even beyond that, Chairman, I believe that we need to have solutions that are not personal, but solutions that stand the test of time. Institutional solutions. And that's why I've been speaking about the coordinated mechanism for the safety of journalists, the Media Capacity Enhancement Program. Because I believe that these are two vehicles that if we support some of these things, some of which may not have been directly brought to my attention, uh, can be arrested. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, yeah, that's all. Yeah, that, um... Chairman, thank you. Um, Minister, um, is the Advertising Association of Ghana under your jurisdiction? No, Chairman. Oh, okay, very well. But I want to proceed a question in that area. They've been clamoring for the passage of the advertising bill, and they, they've been pushing for that for some time. They've been honoring lots of media personal, personalities, including uh, Bernard Avler, and the last Gong Gong Awards, which I believe um, you participated in. They've been supportive of government efforts during this COVID time. Their executive secretary, Juan Francis Dazi, um, mentioned, I think a week ago, about the challenges that they are going to be facing during this after um, inception, and that that bill ought to be passed because if it's not passed, they wouldn't have a council to protect their businesses, and that Nigeria has an advertising bill or act in place that protects, and a council in place that protects that space. You being the Minister for Information, God willing, are you going to? help that association uh, push through that bill the support of the appropriate ministry, I believe in the Ministry of Trade, reading around it. Thank you. Chairman, so, uh, thank you. I've had opportunity to read that bill and to even profess some views to the association on it. I believe that uh, the objective of the association is a very good one. Yes, you are right. In countries like Nigeria, they've made a lot of progress. Not only does it deal with issues of counsel, etc., but even advertising standards and um, other persons entering the marketplace and taking uh, market shares on duly 
from current operators. I think, however, in the last draft of the bill that they brought, um, on their own volition, if my memory serves me right, they withdrew to do some corrections. And they are yet to come back. And as and when they do come back, you have my assurances that I would support the minister responsible for trade to have it passed so that their subsector can also uh, be well regulated to be fruitful or more fruitful for them. Second question is on projecting election results by the media. I'm sure you've projected an election results in this country. I believe, I think in 2008 or 2012, you projected President Mills as the president-elect, I'm sure, around that time. It's become a topical issue. Do you think it's going to help our democracy or it's going to hurt our democracy? Chairman, um, the Honourable Member is right. In 2008, or I think January 2009, when the third round of that election had been concluded, I participated in the projection of the election results at a multimedia group limited to the effect that the candidate of the NDC, uh, Professor John Evans Atta Mills, God bless his soul, um, was going to be the winner of that election. Um, a projection is not a declaration. A projection is a statistical analysis based on all the votes that have come in and what is outstanding. And as democracies mature and media practice matures, it actually helps a democracy. Because as the results come in, in our case from 275 constituencies, and as the media, political science analysts, civil society groups are all before the full glow of the country going through the numbers and doing the analysis, and projecting, not declaring, projecting. They are in a place to now settle and conscientize the minds of the population about where this election is uh, most likely going to um, end. I do not see anything wrong with it. I believe that it is um, part of the growth of the media and its protection that we are talking about here this afternoon. And all efforts that can be made to deepen and to strengthen our democracy and things associated with our elections, such as what you are talking about, should not be discouraged. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I have a program here. Honorable Sweeney. Yeah. All right. Um, thank you. Mr. Chairman. Um, the Chairman, let me um, begin by expressing my concern when the nominee, nominee suggested, because we are past broadcasters, that our previous profession can be censored under the 1992 Constitution. But I think the remedy to what he suggests is in Article 165 and Chapter 5 of the 1992 Constitution. And so media men perhaps should not be that worried that uh, somebody may just censor uh, our work. Mr. Chairman, again, I have tried to uh, avoid questions since this uh, veteran started in relation to what happened to Radio Boat for very good reasons. Um, but in an answer to a question that was asked earlier, I do not know where my colleague gets his briefing from, but it will be instructive for him to keep an open mind and perhaps uh, get briefing from, you know, all parties involved. I do know that uh, the station, uh, after a number of representations, uh, withdrew their challenge even in court. Yes, they challenged the fines. The court ruled in their favor. The authorities saw in the ruling an opportunity to shut it down, it did. It challenged that opportunity again in court, but due to some representations that were done, even including the Parliamentary Select Committee, the station decided to withdraw the cases based on an understanding that had been reached with the Ministry, and followed through with requests that was made of the station to reapply 
for the authorization to use as spectrum. Those letters are yet to be responded to by the authorities. Mr. Chairman, in all of this, my question here. I have seen the memorandum that accompanied the 2014 bill when it was worked on, but it never happened. And in it, as a result of the uh, quote, as a result of the count, as a result of this, the country does not have clear, transparent, and uniformly applied legal criteria for the grant of broadcasting authorizations. Now, I took it from this point because it's talking about the number of laws we have in the media that are not consolidated, and that as a result of this, the country does not have clear, transparent and uniformly applied legal criteria for the grant of broadcasting authorities. Now, this lends the process to arbitrariness and patronage. All the same, at the same time, the regulatory overview of the content of programs is virtually non-existent. I relate this also to a research report by Freedom House International, in which it says, in part, Mr. Chairman, with your permission, that in some parts of the world, the threats to press freedom are explicit and often violent, and that journalists are murdered or imprisoned. States maintain strict media monopolies, and domestic audiences are cut off from foreign news sources. Now, such unambiguously hostile conditions typically elicit strong responses from international advocacy groups and democracies that are committed to defending freedom of expression. However, in a much broader range of countries, Governments are using the more subtle tools of media regulation to restrict press freedom, maintaining a veneer of legality and pluralism that is less likely to draw attention or criticism from abroad. Manipulation of the regulatory framework allows leaders to either tolerate or rein in influential news outlets depending on the political situation and permits even democratically elected governments to fortify themselves against future electoral competitions." Unquote. Now, being a former broadcaster yourself, how does it feel, given what we know, and given the fact that all of this have contributed to Ghana dropping in the ranking when it comes to international, I mean, when it comes to freedom of expression? How do you feel as Minister of Information that all of this is happening under your watch, a former broadcaster, and what have you done to save the situation? Thank you. Indeed, that publication from Freedom House, which you refers to, ends with my comment earlier, and I think I was first to even say that that which ought to be done, which is this broadcasting bill that needs to be looked at and passed, we have to be careful so that it does not become the guise under which we claw back on the rights to free expression. I think I mentioned it earlier. Because there is enough data that shows various jurisdictions where in an attempt to handle some of the excesses that is, or are being complained about here, it has been a cover for these um, clawbacks in those jurisdictions. And I think the point that I was making earlier, which sits very well with the article you just read, which is a view that my brother, who is also a former broadcaster, I believe shares, is that we should be sure that even in trying to solve the problem, we don't create perhaps even a worse problem in this space. My feelings are expressed, I believe, in that route, that this is how we have to handle it. There's a challenge on our hands we have to deal with, but we have to be careful not to fall into this trap. Well, I hope we are not in the trap already. I think I'm suggesting to you that we are already in that trap, and perhaps we must be working together to come out of it. Now, um, the Chairman, in 2017, um, when this House worked, the Seventh Parliament worked on the uh, budgetary allocations to ministries, the uh, committee on information, I think, and communication, presented its report. The chairman, Kennedy Ajapong, complained at the time about how much the state was 
uh, owing the Ghana Broadcasting Corporation. He did put the figure at around 40 million Ghana cities then. Um, in 2019, November 6, actually, there was also a meeting with the president. The NMC uh, complained, or if you like, pleaded with the president to help the Ghana Broadcasting Corporation to pay an electricity debt of about 25 million Ghana cities. I recall uh, going through the new supports that you were instructed to help uh, make that payment. I don't know if that payment has been done. But my question is, recently, um, we lost um, one of our former leaders, uh, the one I refer to as the man who ended the decade of GK and introduced democracy, God bless his soul, uh, Jerry John Rollins. And there was a state funeral that was uh, done. GBC have accumulated these debts over the years as a result of the service that they have been doing for the state on behalf of government. At this state funeral, the information is that the coverage of that funeral was outsourced to independent, you know, um, broadcasters so to speak. Why did the state do this? Do you know how much was involved, who was involved in handling, in outsourcing the coverage of that funeral? So, Chairman, the question is in two parts, uh, about how GBC incurs costs by offering services to the state, and a suggestion that the coverage of the um, funeral rights of His Excellency, the former President, Jared Rawlings, was outsourced. So I'll deal with both. Chairman, I firmly believe that GBC costs for uh, state events must be covered. The Director General of GBC would be the first to attest to my insistence that when a state institution asks them to do some program for them, because they know their financial situation, they should ask that state institution to write through the Ministry of Information. Because we also having clarity on their budgets can also then begin to say the cost of the satellite link or the cost of the wireless link will be X or Y or Z and at least cover it for them. The GBC doesn't incur these costs because those are the costs that are crippling the organization. Chairman here, Parliament, going through these hearings, um, GBC is required to cover it. Just three or four days ago, Director General uh, copied me in on some communication that was ongoing that their internet link between here and Broadcasting House had gone down, and if they did not have the opportunity to fix it, they did not have money to go and rent a satellite link. And I recall um, drawing his attention that if he formally wants to, inform, because we can't interfere in the operation, if he formally wants to inform us to have an engagement with Parliament on their behalf, we'll be happy to do. So I felt costs have to be covered because we can't continue piling on debts upon debts upon debts. So it's a view that I think we share together. And uh, to the extent that uh, GBC involves the Ministry of Information in requests to cover state items, we will do well to encourage whichever ministry, department, or agency out of their budget to cover at least the cost of the satellite links, etc., because uh, somebody has to pay. The second is this... Um, suggestion or claim that the coverage was outsourced. That would be incorrect. The coverage was done by state and private media altogether. The arrangements were such that a media village was constructed where all media that was accredited was brought in, local and international. And feed was provided from the inner perimeter where the mortal remains of His Excellency the President uh, was into the media village and a distribution box was made available for everybody to plug in and take that feed. Why? Because the Jerry Rawlings Foundation and the family requested that they did not want a multiplicity of cameras in the inner perimeter where the mortal remains of His Excellency, the former president, uh, was. And they nominated to us an entity which they said they were comfortable with them being in the inner perimeter and bringing the shots out to everybody. I believe it was not unreasonable to accede to the request 
of the family of His Excellency, the former president. And I believe that the media, as was all available in the media village, got very clean, distinct feet, and we did not have undignifying photos or shots of His Excellency, our former president. But everybody was allowed coverage. Local and international media was allowed coverage from the media village and around the entire enterprise. The only place where cameras were not allowed, save for the cameras that the family requested to be in there, was the inner perimeter where His Excellency, the former president, was lying in state. So, so just a clarification. So the, the, the village and the entity that provided a feed, understand, my understanding is that it, the, that entity that was responsible for those was recommended by the family which you acceded to. Yes. At, at, at what cost? You didn't... Talk. We have not incurred any expenses on that. Okay. Now to my next question. Um, you have talked about the role of the National Media Commission. And clearly, we all know that the DTT is the future. As part of the policy, um, there's to be a company set up. Um, that company is supposed to have a board. Per the policy document, the board is to be appointed by the president. Unfortunately, the institutions that are to be represented on the board, um, the NMC is not included in those um, you know, recommended institutions. I'm sure this has come to your attention. Again, the company that has been set up, uh, my checks at the Register General, is Central Digital Transmission Company Limited. It is listed as a private um, company, uh, has um, its uh, lawyers as um, the, the secretary to the, as, um, Yeah, so has its uh, secretary to be the Akufuado Prempe and Co. And, and others. Has this come to your attention and do you think this is appropriate? One, the fact that the board does not include the NMC and then this company uh, listed as a private entity. Chairman, so um, for the matters you have listed, what has come to my attention, what I've been involved in, is the constitution of the board of the um, Central Digital um, uh, company. And I have actually um, sent in a recommendation to the Honorable Minister for Communications on our views on how the board should be structured. That were matters to do with the operation of that organization, it is my understanding, were not completed before the first term of the Akufo administration came to an end. My hope will be that when you approve me. Chairman, just one, uh, I've just heard you make reference to Minister for Communication and your good self on Central Digital Board. Is it governed by any legislation, that board? Is there a legal framework? Well, Chairman, as we stand now, the board and its constitution, its operation, the entire organization, are matters that were not completed before the turn of the previous administration ended. And that is why I said that the one I was aware of and involved in was this constitution of the board. And my expectation is that when you approve me and we do get back in, we can work on these residual matters and tidy them up. Gentlemen, my question is still, uh, I believe, relevant. Parliamentary Service Board, enabling legislation, Article 124 of the Constitution, this Central Digital Broadcast Board, what is the enabling law supporting its existence and its operation? Thank you. Well, Chairman, at the risk of not going into too much detail, that is what I'm hinting at, some of the residual matters which um, were not completed. And my hope is to approve me and I do get in. I'll work with the Honorable Minister to tidy all of those issues up. Now one for our fraternity, the GJA in Upper East Region. The GJA in Upper East Region. The claim you made a pledge of 10,000 Ghana cities in support of one of their activities. You are yet to redeem 
and even on social media when one of their colleagues prompted you about that pledge made to them. You cause uh, the person to come under so much attack that he had to apologize for reminding you of the need to redeem that pledge to support the GJ with that said amount. What do you have to say to that? Chairman, <laughs> unfortunately, I'm not aware of the social media chatter that my brother um, refers to. I do recall uh, making a pledge to the Upper East um, Regional Branch of the GJ after I traveled to join them in one celebration. And I do recall issuing the instruction uh, to our chief director to ensure that it is satisfied. I would expect that it is satisfied uh, by now. If it is not, I'll be happy to look at it once again. But the social media chatter, with the greatest of respect, uh, I will not be privy to it. Well, I thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I want the nominee to very quickly uh, come with me through his CV very quickly. I'm sure that page one, he wanted to communicate to Wasi. Page two, the employment history, January 7, 2017. It should be ending January 6, 2021 is for the accuracy of our records and not January 7. Uh, your tenure as MP and as uh, uh, the next entry, that should also be amended to January 6, 2021, because by, by midnight, we all did not have, by midnight of January 6, we all did not have uh, portfolios uh, as it were. Page three of your CV, we will also have to clean up President Kufu as former head of state. We have to capture that accurately with think tanks as well. And the, the final page, I'm sure, I'm sure uh, Pram Pram is the address you want to provide. So I believe that these matters can be cleaned up with the clerk uh, moving forward. My first question to the Honorable Nominee relates to a matter you keep stressing, which is validation. We lack validation. We lack, we lack validation of attacks on journalists, and that it shouldn't be I say, you say. I hold in my hands a compilation by the Media Foundation for West Africa, chronicling what they call press freedom violations in Ghana from January 27 to December 2020. They have chronicled as many as 56 of these violations, which is staggering. In uh, real essence, it means that on the average, we are talking about one attack a month on the average, and, and, and uh, for the four-year period. You'll agree that that is also affecting our global press freedom index and ratings for that matter. Number one place in Africa, 2018, we were 23 out of 180 countries surveyed. We have dropped to number 30. 2019, we dropped four places. 2020, we dropped three places. And we keep sliding uh, negatively. Will you consider this compilation by the Media Foundation for West Africa a credible validation, which you have been requesting for, that we need to have? And how are you going to respond to this report and end this rather uh, sad situation that journalists find themselves in. Uh, I don't know if you are conversant with the report, but you see that uh, virtually every non-journalist is featuring here on this list, from Anas to Maru Sander, Dela Rosoloklu, Edwada Deti, Latif Idris, Kwachia Fren Yama, Ahmed Hussein Swale, Captain Smart, Abdul Hai Mumin, Western Amwa, Evans Mensa, Gifty Ando Atia, Philip Osei Bonsu, Lord Edu Asari, Sandra Obridia, Osei Kwejo of PFM, and many others. 
have you seen this report and uh, does this constitute enough validation as you are looking for? Gentlemen, the Media Foundation for West Africa is a very well respected uh, civil society organization in the area of uh, press advocacy and press freedoms. I don't have much basis to doubt what they will put out. Suleiman himself is a very well respected person. Uh, yeah, welcome back to our coverage of the ministerial uh, nominee vetting going on in Parliament right now. Let's go back. My third question to the nominee. Honorable Oblaka, just a second. Chairman, with your leave, I think Honorable Haruna Idrisu made the point that you are information minister. Are you able to get in touch with Ghana Airport Company Limited to give us some information as to whether there is a contract executed between uh, its office and that of uh, Frontiers Healthcare Services? Well, Chairman, as I mentioned earlier, I believe that the Minister for Transport Designate will be appearing before you and will be able to perhaps deliver the closest to first-hand information on it. If I am requested by a committee, to engage Ghana Airport Company Limited and fetch a copy of it for, for, for Parliament or for the committee within the rules of what is appropriate, I'm sure I'll be able to oblige that. Mr. Chairman, my final question to the nominee relates to a matter he has been very vocal about and speaks to quite often, the financial sector cleanup. And, uh, you have indicted the previous government for regulatory weakness and laxities. You have also said that there's a need to take on shareholders and directors who have plunged this country into the significant pain and suffering of many, many of our compatriots. But I have been researching on the list the Bank of Ghana published, the 347 microfinance limited uh, co companies list as published. And I see a company called Oval Microfinance Limited. I'm looking at page two of your CV you indicate that between 2014 and 2016, you were managing director of West Brownstone Capital Accra. West Brownstone Capital Limited is listed in the documentation I have here from the DOG as an affiliated company of Over Microfinance Limited, which is one of the companies whose licenses have been revoked by the BOG. And the BOG concerns are that the company valued a two-story building at Pokiasi, owned by Vincent Kojopon Kroma, shareholder, and has capitalized it without approval from Bank of Ghana. The market value was 1.6 million. Majority shareholder Vincent Kojopon Kroma transferred all shares 82% to West Brownstone Capital Limited, an affiliate of Over Microfinance Limited, without approval from Bank of Ghana. Companies registered approved paid up capital by Bank of Ghana was 100,000 Ghana cities as of 30 September 2017 and was below the statutory requirement of 2 million for all tier 2 microfinance companies. The company's paid up capital was impaired due to persistent losses arising from poor loan recovery and high operational costs, contrary to Section 28.1 of the Banks and Specialized Deposit Taking Institutions Act 2016 at 930. The net owned funds was negative 5.161 million. Company's capital decrease ratio was 487.46%. Non-performing loss of 1.4 million. The company failed to honor its statutory payments such as staff income tax and social security and national insurance trust contribution to its workers since January 2017. Company defaulted maintenance of primary reserves. The company was rated critical the company was insolvent. This is the examination report. And the directors here, Kwame Opon, Kuma, Mark Ben, Edua, Samoa, Patrick Kinsley, Nina, J. 
Nigeria, Abu Jemfi. How do you respond to this report? And how do you assure Ghanaians that this whole financial sector cleanup and the punishment of persons or, or sanctions being meted out to persons who cause this is being done fairly and nobody, uh, including your good self, is being left off the hook? Chairman, thank you. Um, yes, I have spoken uh, on behalf of government about the financial sector cleanup exercise. Um, we have been at pains to explain the various reasons uh, that occasion the difficulties in the financial services sector, including, as uh, my brother mentioned, uh, questions of regulation, etc. Yes, Chairman, he is right. Um, 2014 and 2016, my private business um, invested in uh, this organization as uh, the largest shareholding entity in this organization. Um, between, I think, 2017 and 2019, the directors and management reported to us that they were having difficulties and requested of us to recapitalize the organization. I was not in a position to inject any further capital. The uh, outline that you have mentioned talks about my personal investments in the company. I was not in a position to invest any further capital in the organization. And the Bank of Ghana, after it adjusted the statutory requirements for capital, because the requirements for entry was not the same as they kept adjusting, I came to the view that they were in breach of what the new statutory requirement was. Uh, as I mentioned, I as a shareholder, and indeed many of the other shareholders, could not um, reinvest in the organization, as was being required by the directors and uh, the management. And the Bank of Ghana effectively revoked its uh, license accordingly. I believe the second part of your question will deal with whether or not there's any impropriety that is found on the part of the directors or managers or shareholders. And to that extent, I'm not sure that the report before you suggests so. The report suggests that West Brownstone is a beneficiary of uh, what is known in the industry as uh, yeah. I'm looking for the that, that page of the of the report, but essentially that that as shareholder you were. You were given some money, uh, about uh, 212,000, and actually you are the, amongst the top 20 uh, defaulting customers. West Brownstone is number one. Uh, Chairman, I'm not sure that uh, will be accurate. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, uh, West Brownstone was not indebted to the uh, organization as at um, the time that uh, the Bank of Ghana was conducting its exercise. So, so there was no uh, internal uh, party lending in this instance? There was no outstanding liability. Okay. I'm grateful, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. I also wish to congratulate the Honorable Minister nominee. Honorable Minister, social media has been referred to today in terms of its negative impact and abuse. But social media has now become an integral part of communication. How do you intend to use social media? You have already referred to the Afrobarometer report, which states that at least a third of Ghanaians are looking to digital information and communication. How do you intend to use social media as a medium to educate and inform Ghanaians about government policies and programs and to seek their feedback on the governance process? Chairman, yeah, thank you. Um, I think as I mentioned at my last appearance before your committee, social media cannot be ignored in the communication enterprise. And for that reason, um, we, for example, at the ministry, set up our own social media unit, which today I think has been able to recruit about 1.2 million 
uh, individual Ghanaians and therefore is able to reach out to them directly. We've also encouraged ministries, departments and agencies and actually supported them in having dedicated social media channels that are able to directly engage with the Ghanaian public. Our expectation will be that moving forward, we're able to extend that even to the retail level to include specifically uh, members of parliament and other high-ranking uh, officials that people expect to receive or uh, consume information from. But in so doing, ensure that their accounts and their handles are verified uh, so that the risk of uh, people utilizing it for other purposes is curtailed. Uh, Mr. Chairman, during your tenure as uh, Substantive Minister for Information, we saw a tremendous transformation of some of the agencies under you, like the Ghana Publishing Corporation. A lot of physical infrastructure changes and equipment. Unfortunately, some of the other agencies like GBC, and I kindly respectfully request of you to visit GBC in Kumasi the next time you are there, uh, their facilities require some facelift, and I believe some other regional GBC offices. Is there any plans to look to upgrade some of the physical infrastructure of GBC across the country? Chairman, yes, it's a question of resourcing. But as I hinted earlier, the National Media Commission is leading a GBC reorganization program. Our expectation is that out of that program, there will be clarity in terms of the legislation, in terms of the resource requirements, and we'll be able to do this exercise of reinvesting in uh, GBC and some of the other uh, state-owned media organizations. Yes, and the right to information bill was passed under you as minister. I know you have done a lot. Can you briefly tell us the status of implementation and what measures will be taken to educate Ghanaians on how to take advantage of the right to information? In my responses earlier, I outlined the many things that the RTI um, division as we created at the Information Service Department has achieved and the benefits that have come out um, of that. I think one of the outstanding items, I mentioned some items are outstanding, is public education on it. If you don't complete the internal work and you uh, make a lot of noise about it publicly, what ends up happening is that um, you cannot deliver even on your uh, brand promise to users. So having come to the end of the internal exercises that must take place, we'll be looking to do a lot more of the public education so that people can know where to go for information, how to apply for it, how to seek redress if they feel there are challenges. Chairman, may I also mention that the RTI Commission has been um, set up, the board, the governing board has been sworn in by His Excellency the President and they have commenced uh, their work. They are taking leadership in working with us to develop the legislative instrument that is required to flesh out the gaps in the ITI Act. Yes, Neil Thank you very much, Honorable Chairman. First, Honorable Nominee, let me ask you, um, former staff of GBC who have gone on retirement, for the past years, been fighting for the payment of their end of service entitlements. Over a period, about for almost about a year now, faithful servants of this country like Getulio Pariado, Esther Sinofred, Kumasi, and the rest have been traversing your office without any attention. What really is the problem? Why are they not being paid their end of service awards? Well, Chairman, if the suggestion is made that they have been traversing my office without any attention, I would respectfully say that that suggestion would be incorrect. Uh, I have had a meeting with them here in my office in Parliament where they outlined their challenges and served me with a document which I ferried to the GBC Director General and then I think to the board chair of GBC. Chairman, as I've mentioned earlier, when dealing with state-owned media, you have to be extra careful. The National Media Commission takes leadership in their matters. This is a particular matter that, if my recollection is accurate, 
they have, I think, a collective bargaining agreement or some union structures that um, create some benefits for them. The challenge has been how they will fund those benefits at their company level. And uh, they have quite a significant backlog of uh, people who have worked there and who they expect to benefit from this, I think, union agreement or CBA, who are not benefiting uh, from it. Our expectation, Chairman, is that under the reorganization program and the resources that can hopefully be made available under that program, we can satisfy some of those obligations that GBC itself is struggling to uh, satisfy. Between their, um, may I say, representation to me and then what I've done is to bring their issue to the limelight, to the quarters that matter, uh, that if some resourcing can be made available and prioritized, maybe in terms of age, um, to begin to dispose of it while we're waiting for a substantive uh, answer, it won't be a bad idea. John, permit me another GBC question because you should know. The Bible says go back to the first your second question, please. So, um, in an answer to a previous question, you mentioned the training of good spokespersons on various sectors. I want to ask, why would you go out to recruit the spokespersons when we already have the Information Service Department staff trained? And also, even GBC rural radio stations out there who can easily communicate government policies and programs. Chairman, thank you. I think the simple answer is that some of the areas are technical. For example, we are about to have a vaccination rollout program. Vaccination rollout program comes with things like ultra freeze temperature management, uh, logistics, and other things, which are very technical, but which, for the purposes of what we are doing, require some mass communication. I am not even equipped, um, even after my years in this enterprise, etc., to be the one to lead this technical aspect of the communication. And so are many aspects of our national life developing and requiring that we have people who are well skilled to lead that kind of communication enterprise. And so the reason for which we will be uh, looking to invest in these five um, spokespersons uh, is to mirror them to each of the five subcategories of cabinet so that for the various sectors, infrastructure is a technical area, security is a technical area, general administration is another area, as I mentioned, social services, including health, etc. they can do um, that bridging of the gap at the top level. That is not to say that at the ground level or across to uh, the ground, you are going to be recruiting spokespersons. No, we are talking about these five um, subcategories of cabinet uh, so that they can help regularly interact, provide the answers that the media is looking for in these areas. Same on GBC, with my past experience. For time now, GBC has problems covering for Ghanaians, for the benefit and enjoyment of Ghanaians, certain very important sporting activities and events. For example, a Ghanaian is involved in a world title fight, the Olympic Games, and the rest. It becomes almost difficult for GBC able to send these signals to our rural areas like the Chairman's constituency. Because of the commercial interest involved in this, the GBC is said to go out there and compete with other private institutions to get sponsorship for these things, which normally is not the case. GBC has a public there is a social responsibility to the Ghanaian. What are you going to do to make sure that at least government in its um, responsibility towards the Ghanaian takes or helps GBC to be able to also do this or discharge this responsibility to the Ghanaian populace? Chairman, I think it's about rights building a consortium, getting advertising resources or resources to pay for it. In the last major tournament, I don't quite recall the, the name of the tournament, um, when, when, when I was approached by what they call the consortium, I invited all of them to a meeting and opted to assist them in two ways. First, 
for the state to pre-finance the rights, and second, for the consortium to commercialize the rights so that we can at least refund what the state had paid. And I think we were able to recoup, I dare say, about 90% of what the state um, invested. And my suggestion to them, and again, because GBC, state-owned media, you can't dictate, you can't um, direct them what to do. My suggestion to them was to make that consortium permanent. So a consortium on sporting rights, made up of public and private media here in Ghana, so that when these big events or these big sports games, etc., are coming up and the, the consortium is interested, the government can assist by prepaying and can assist them to ensure that we sell to all of these private entities that are looking for the same eyeballs, and then that money can be refunded. Uh, it is a proposal we've made available to, to them. They promise that they will come back um, on it. I expect uh, that if I do resume office, they will come back and will be able to act on it accordingly. My last question, Chairman. There was recent Kula Balu about your ministry, one of your ministries, let me say Ministry of Communication and the National Communication Authority. One of, I mean, government say, ministries. I'm not saying he speaks ministry. for government. Honorable, did you say one of his ministries? No, one of government's ministries. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, taking back or appropriating some of these old frequencies and uh, channels that have been reserved for GBC since long from which one, of, one was given to multimedia to get you to work there. Huh? I said one of the frequencies is what Joy has used in the time past to get you a job to do. <laughs> oh, I'm coming to my question. Why are you in a hurry? <laughs> what was your reaction to that? And do you think it was necessary for that attempt in the first place? Chairman, that's a quick correction. Um, no, I did not um, work on any of the channels that had, or any of the DTT channels that had been given um, by GBC out. I worked at on 99.7, which was an arrangement earlier between GBC and them. But the issue you are talking about are the DTT um, transmission channels on their multiplex, if I'm correct. So, Chairman, you would recall that um, with the advent of DTT and various technologies, there are different transmission companies. So there's multi-TV that transmits, there's DSTV that transmits. In fact, GBC TV has what we call the T1. That has about 11 or 12 other channels on it. Um, I think when COVID came and we were looking for channels, it was even GBC T1 that had one redundancy channel, and I mentioned it as part of the successes we've talked, that they were able to create um, the learning channel, which helped us pretty well. My understanding is that the uh, operators of the DTT channel under the Ministry of Communications sought to create redundancies on their platform and invited all the stations that had more than, I think, one or two channels to a meeting and explained to them the rationale and suggested that they should go back, engage with their boards and management, think through it, so that in the end, they could keep their two most important channels on it and then redundancies could be created. Now, Chairman, you recall that GBC, for example, operates all of its six channels on the T1 platform and has even added other private channels onto it. GBC has one channel on the DSTV platform, and I believe, I think on Star Times and other platforms. It was unfortunate that after that initial conversation with GBC, what came out was news reportage that the Minister of Communications had instructed GBC to shut down six channels. I don't think that that was an accurate reflection of the conversation that was going on. I think GBC petitioned the National Media Commission and I wrote a brief to inform the National Media Commission on what I knew about the situation and how I thought we could resolve it. Um, thankfully, the matter has not been retired. 
You'll recall that um, as part of the engagements that were ongoing, the president instructed that um, the processes be halted for some further consultations. And I believe all the representations that have been made, including the brief that I sent in, will all be factored in in resolving the matter. The second level of the question, do you think it's necessary? <laughs> Thank you. Yes, Honorable Do you think Patricia, the second level of the question has not been answered? Do you think that exercise is really necessary? Honorable Patricia PJP. Right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Honorable nominee, congratulations once again. The Honorable Mr. Chairman, the Honorable nominee, in an earlier submission, made a very interesting but factual statement that the media provides sunlight that helps our democracy grow. Mr. Chairman, it is widely known that one critical challenge confronting the media industry is capacity building. Your predecessor, when he attended to the House in 2017, gave us an assurance that he's going to actually uh, deploy some of the funds for media development, the media development fund, to address this challenge. You've also mentioned um, a scheme. But you, you, you mentioned an enhancement, media enhancement scheme. Uh, I'll be very interested if you can uh, expatiate on this scheme for the benefit of this house. Thank you, so that we know exactly where you're going. Chairman, thank you. Chairman, very briefly, it is actually the same thing. Initially, there was a conversation of a media development fund. Indeed, the previous administration attempted it, uh, administered it in a particular manner. When we assumed office, when I was deputy minister, uh, the minister at the time worked to see if we could revive that fund for it to uh, progress. And it's in that light that he made those representations. Eventually, when we settled on, and by the time I was in the chair, was the Media Capacity Enhancement Program, which is a targeted response by helping to put whatever resources that government can find and can mobilize to use in terms of helping to build the capacity of uh, 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 practicing media persons. Now, because government doesn't want to be the one determining the content, etc., what we did was to set up a working group made up of people within the industry and academia and to um, create a framework where we can provide them with the resources for them to actually go about the exercise of doing the administering of the Capacity Enhancement Program, and we look forward to it taking full flight in the second term. Honorable uh, now leadership. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chairman, I just want to find out from the nominee in an answer to an earlier question about the 56 incidents of attack on the media over the period 2017-2020, and our ranking from 20, uh, 23rd position in 2018 to 30th, he mentioned a lot about what National Media Commission is doing to enhance media freedom in our country. I just want to find out from him, over this period that you were there, you were deputy and then substitute minister, what concrete steps have you taken or have you put in place to enhance media freedom in our country? Chairman, I've mentioned two specific programs under my leadership, which the is us are being institutionalized, would lead us to eventually overcome this challenge. One is the coordinated mechanism for the safety of journalists, which we believe is a big response to protecting media freedoms. That is the one that I've said that we drew up the program working with the NMC, GIJ, GJA, GIBA, and out of that came up with a cabinet memo, went to cabinet, got approval with the caveat that NMC should implement and not us. And we have provided resources to the NMC 
and they are on the path to fully executing it. And I used this committee's hearing as a platform to appeal to all who are interested in protecting media freedoms to help support the NMC, including financially and with resources, so that they can excel in utilizing it. Now, Mr. Chairman, that's where my worry is, because this program, as you may be aware, had been there before you got your ministry. Which one? The coordinating? This, yes, the National Comprehensive Framework on Safety of Journalism. I'm not aware of this, and it is very, this is a program, as I'm speaking about, that yeah. we conceptualized right from the beginning. Right. Our, our, our media colleagues themselves will tell you about the meetings we had at uh, Lisa Hotel, etc., to put it together. So this is not the national um, uh, comprehensive, the comprehensive framework. How different is that from what was well, there? Well, I don't even know about it, so that's how come I don't even and know. My worry is that it for is. four years, if we've not been able to get its full implementation, what guarantee are you giving us that in the next four years, if given the norm, this will be fully implemented? Chairman, I've been minister for two years, and in this two-year period um, is when the crisis itself escalated, during which period I've had to put in place this response. My hope is that in the next four years, we all will be able to get some support and resourcing for the NMC to fully execute it. The, chairman, and the second is the Media Capacity Enhancement Program, which is aimed at building or enhancing capacity. The media has outstanding capacity, but we need to build on it. Uh, and that is the other one that I spoke to. Uh, so again, for that as well. But that is being uh, led by us directly, but the working group on it uh, is the one that is uh, executing directly. Mr. Chairman, on 30th May 2018, you and I own colleague, you and I, our colleague, Arabo Kenny Japan, sat on his radio station and TV, and out of anger from the investigative journalism of uh, Tiger IPI, made a lot of comments, some even attacks, and suggested that persons, I mean, if I may quote in three, he said, if you meet him anywhere, slap him mercilessly. Yes, I said it. Beat him. He added, this is a matter, I mean, this is a matter of public. Yeah. What were, at the time, even though I know at that time you were a deputy minister, and that, uh, in that sector, Sorry, what is that did you said do? that? Come again. I, I had a quote. Who was, who was being quoted? I was quoting Kenny Japan. And I said that even though during that time he was a deputy minister, what did you do when the member of parliament was issuing all these threats? Well, Chairman, that specific matter, as I'm sure you are aware, is still the subject of uh, ongoing police investigation. I would pray your indulgence that I do not make any comments on it. Well, Mr. Chairman, will he agree that such acts are attack on media freedom? Chairman, I think in my earlier responses, I have said quite clearly that no amount of harassment or verbal or physical attacks should be inflicted on the media, even if we think that it is indulging in what some may describe as irresponsible conduct. Because for some, it is because that is the only way they know. And what we ought to do is to support them with training and resources so that they get on the right path. I believe that uh, my comments express clearly how I feel about that matter. So you agree that that was an attack on media freedom? Chairman, as I mentioned, I, I, I believe that my comments express how I feel on that matter. So you agree that that was an attack on media freedom? Honorable Mr. Chairman, this is a very straightforward yes, no. Because you have said, the Constitution has said so, and you have also expressed that yes, regardless of whatever happened, harassment, attack, and probably even West Meda, I know you and can media. make your own interpretation from his statement that if you, you agree, he's asking for an opinion, which you know are rules on that. So your interpretation is up to you, but please leave him out of that. Yes, so I just want to hear you. So you agree that that action. Chairman, it goes without saying, I have, I, have, I have expressed how I feel about it. I believe it goes without saying that, yes, that is my position. Unfortunately, even though you yourself 
you were a practitioner and at that time you were a deputy minister. I never heard you condemn this. Why? Well, Chairman, the truth is that at that material moment, I honestly was not aware of this matter until after the fact when all of these things came up. Chairman, there are 500 and so radio stations across the country. Not everything that happens on those platforms come to my attention in real time. In this particular instance, as you talk about, I believe even for many of us, it was after the fact that the associated matters became publicly known. So it would not be out of ten that you would not have heard me at that time because it, it was not something I was aware of. But when it did come out with the videos and the comments, I never heard you. Because when it did that. come up, it was also now a matter of a, a subject of police investigation, and I cannot prejudice that. No, but condemning an act does not in any way interfere with investigation. Condemning the act, Chairman, we have today before you, I have extensively spoken about why I do not believe that media should be attacked or harassed in any way. I think my position on that is very clear. But on a specific matter that was under investigation at the time it came to public limelight, um, I pray my leader to bear with me that it would not have been appropriate for me to be speaking on ongoing investigations. Mr. Chairman, for the avoidance of doubt, I've heard him speak earlier on the murder of uh, Ahmed Swale and how you were saying that's the perception that is even you yourself, yourself, that's also the impression that you're also carrying, the suspicion. It's been over two years. Has government found any contrary position to the fact that he was murdered because of the work that he did? The police have not told us so. So, so long as we are concerned, he was murdered because of the work that he did, and that was attacked on the... Uh, yeah, that's a suspicion that we are all operating with. So you agree... Including that, myself. It, it, including myself. That's a suspicion that we are all operating with. So you agree with the International uh, uh, Press Freedom when they add the murder of Ahmed Swale as part of those who have died on, in, the, in the line of their duty. To the extent that no contrary evidence has been provided, yes, I would agree with them. Honourable Member, what is the basis of that conclusion? Have they provided any evidence to suggest that? Evidence has been provided to suggest otherwise. I will not fault an international organization that therefore proceeds on the generally suspected view and adds it to their rankings. What do you then say to those who claim that, well, it's sad, it's unfortunate for people to say that the murder of Ahmed Swale is an attack on press freedom? What do you say to people who claim that it is sad and unfortunate that the murder of Ahmed Swale is being counted as attack on media freedom? Well, I think that they need to understand the context within which uh, some of these statistics, etc., are put to, uh, together. Because unless you have some contrary evidence, the generally suspected view is what will be applied in this case. But this is also why, Chairman, as I mentioned earlier, it's important to have a mechanism that helps us to validate, to track, to follow up, to put pressure on the entities that must work. So do you remember the President saying this himself? The, the President, our President saying this himself? Saying what? That it's unfortunate that the death of Ahmed Swale is being uh, associated with attack on uh, uh, media freedom. If those are his words, I think that is also understandable because, like I've explained, you either have contrary evidence or how those who are accounting for it on the global platforms will do will be to add it. But for the president of our country, where we are constitution and as people, we tout ourselves in the freedom of expression of the individual. Do you think that this was a good thing for the President to say that uh, it's sad and unfortunate that people are associating the death of Ahmed Swale to uh, attack on uh, press freedom? Yes, because it would have been best if the police had come to a conclusion on that investigation so that that matter can be settled. To that extent that it is not done, it's a sad spectacle. Aramunamini, do you remember in July 2019 in London, during the Global Media Freedom Conference. This is why you said, it is very disappointing that a case of Ahmed Swale as high profile like that which worked as back on press freedom has remained unresolved. 
Why did you, and unquote, why did you say this? Walk us back on press freedom. If because you were, if you didn't believe, or if you will support those who say it is sad and unfortunate that his death is being associated with Because, with Chairman, press consistent freedom. with the conversation we've been having, until you have contrary evidence, it will be added and it will walk us back. Now, as the Minister for Information and also uh, uh, maybe a former practitioner in the media setting, since the death of Ahmed Saleh, has there, is there any steps that you have taken to help speed up the investigation? Because it's been two years, it's about two years, and no information is yeah. coming from there. Chairman, the okay. President's uh, representative at the Ministry for the Interior will be the first to attest to the regularity of my uh, queries to him on how far they have come uh, on that. As you do know, investigations are within the ambit of um, uh, the police that is under the Interior Ministry. I cannot bypass him and go directly to the agencies. But he will be the first um, to speak to the regularity with which I request for an update from him. Because the truth is that it's not a pleasant thing for that thing to be hanging around um, our press freedom record. It will be important for the police to come to the bottom of it, find the persons responsible, and uh, bring them to account. I do concede that sometimes investigations take time, even in the best of uh, police environments, but I think we cannot stop but continuously remind the police that that is an outstanding matter that must be resolved. Mr. Mr. Chairman, when a journalist on Munti FM is said to have threatened the life of the president, if, can you hear me? I'm saying that when a journalist on Munti FM is alleged to have threatened the life of the president, he was arrested and he's facing trial. When the, the Honorable Fusu Ampofu, the national chairman of NDC, is alleged to have threatened the chair of EC, he is facing trial. So why is our colleague Honorable Kenneth Japon, who is who said all he did before the murder of Ahmed Swale, is not facing trial? Chairman, with respect, the police and the prosecutorial authorities will be the best place to answer that question. I am incapable of providing an answer to that. Mr. Chairman, I often hear you ad advise. And this is still Joy News here. We're bringing you live coverage from Parliament. It is the vetting of the ministerial nominee vetting. Kojo Ponkrumah, Minister-designate for Information, is on the hot seat right now. Uh, what you just heard was an interaction between him and the... Uh, and the um, uh, Muntaka Mubarak, member of parliament for Asawasi, there about Ahmed Swale. Uh, be at the beginning of the conversation, was about Ahmed Swale's uh, the investigation of Ahmed Swale's uh, death. But let me tell you about what has been happening so far. Uh, it's been quite a number of hours. This started as far back as about 2 uh, 2 2.30 p.m. or thereabout, and it is still. Um, ongoing some of the main things that have been discussed at this particular vetting has been uh, press freedom attacks on the media or attacks on journalists the cost of public broadcasting and of course legislation around public broadcasting also political ownership of media houses has come up for discussion and of course the frontiers a uh, health uh, company that's uh, conducting the uh, COVID-19 test at the airport has also uh, come up for some answers. Um, there was a question about um, uh, the work that the Information Ministry has done as far as GBC, GNA, Ghanaian Times and all the allied media uh, uh, entities uh, have performed over the time and the minister designate did answer said said you know there has been exponential growth especially with gna and the work that has been done as far as gbc is concerned the world there was also talk about assigning pros to some state um entities well we will try and get you back to parliament and get get you to uh, follow that vetting which is uh, ongoing We've lost the feed right now, but just a few pointers of what has been going on, what has been said so far. The minister designates indicated that there is a twice, uh, uh, there is an engagement that he does twice a year with all public uh, uh, 
public relations officials of government agencies and he says they are make they make sure that these people are represented in high level um, management uh, meetings. There was also a question about the role of the NCCE when it comes to information dissemination, not just co not just communicating government business uh, or government position. And he answered that as well. There was a question about perception of attacks on media, uh, which the the questioner indicated had been manifested in radio station shutdowns, and how the ministry, uh, the minister designate intends to fend off that perception of attacks on the uh, media. They actually cited He actually cited instances where he himself has said that he had stepped in personally to support media personnel who have been who are said to have come under attack Manasseh Azuria when he mentioned the fear procure uh, as well and then he mentioned Ahmed Swale he says he has been in constant touch with the minister for former minister for interior who is now the president representative at the interior ministry and said he has been in constant touch to make sure uh, he gets an update on uh, the investigation so far he talks about Manasseh Azuria when in which he says has reported or had reported that his life was in danger and he said that together with the Ministry of um, National Security, they had provided uh, some security for Manasseh Azuria when he said later on he understood that Manasseh had traveled out of the country but did not hear from Manasseh himself that he had gone into exile, to put it that way. He said it was Professor Kwame Kekeri who indicated that in a lecture. And um, as such, his position is that the country ought to have a well-coordinated mechanism, which he said the NMC has started, which is meant at the safety of journalists. Obi Amwa came in and asked the question about um, editors and publishers and control of government when it comes to their work and whether or not the Akufuado administration has done well in as far as uh, that is concerned. He said not only has the government done well, but it has also enhanced access to information and expanded uh, the frontiers. There was a question about public order, national security, adequate laws, uh, whether or not there are adequate laws to back uh, this position, which is, you know, that you can censor information or you can censor the media when it comes to national security or when it comes to public morality. Uh, he indicated, uh, he, he cited some examples in the Constitution uh, and indicated that all of these will be best grounded in a broadcasting act, which apparently he says is, uh, is hanging, and he will make sure that it is relayed in Parliament for the necessary uh, consideration. Then there was the question about politicians' ownership or ownership of media houses, political ownership of media houses. He says it is a position between two extremes and that the constitution allows anybody who qualifies to own a media organization what and he doesn't disagree uh, to that but what he believes has to be done is to have for ghana to have a legislative framework that proscribes certain uh, material from being published etc and if that is done it wouldn't matter whether or not a media organization is owned by a politician let me take you back to parliament uh, right now here that the minister did talk to you or consulted you before engaging Ghana Broadcasting Corporation. And I'm asking you whether you are in the know that she did consult National Media Commission. This is a very simple yes or no. Well, Chairman, I do not have any information to that effect. So, so you are not sure whether she did or she didn't? I do not have any information. Honorable Chief, please move on. He has answered that question about five times. What would you say to, the, to those who say the attempt to take over the channels of Ghana Broadcasting Corporation without consulting the National Media Commission was a usurpation of the powers of the National Media Commission and an attempt to disregard the National Media Commission in the affairs of the state broadcasters? Chairman, if there was no consultation, then that would be the case. But as I mentioned, I am not able to respond to that question as I said before you. What will you do as a sector minister if approved to avert a situation of DR, some of the attendance being taken in future? Chairman, as I've mentioned, there's a GBC reorganization program which includes which platforms they will be operating on, how many of their channels they intend to put on those uh, platforms, how they'll be funded. 
what their legislation says. It's an entire program that the National Media Commission is uh, leading for us to execute. It's my expectation that that program will respond to uh, all of these outstanding concerns about GBC. Others are of the view that our current structure where the National Communication Authority authorizes and uh, supervises the authorization certificate of frequent, uh, what we call frequencies to FM stations and TV stations should be something that should have rather be under the National Media Commission. What, do you, what is your view on this? As in the frequency authorization? Yes, authorizations. Chairman, I don't share that view. Oh, why? Because the usage of frequency is not just by media. And so a body that is dedicated to the management of frequency, distinct from the National Media Commission, which is a constitutional creature with its functions, is the best placed body to handle authorization matters. Mr. Chairman, in an earlier answer to your question about the Central Digital Transmission Company Limited, he said the process was not completed and he believed that the implementation hadn't started. Just for the avoidance of doubt, I just want to be sure whether this was a public entity or a private entity. Um, honestly, Chairman, my recollection of the type of entity is not very clear. I honestly do not recall what type of entity that it was. There were, and that's why in answer to the earlier question, I said the parts of that conversation that I recall include the constitution of the board, which I wrote to the Honorable Minister about, which we are in the process of working on. Unfortunately, it could not be completed before the term ended. And this company was supposed to more or less regulate the flow of the TV channels in the country, is that right? No, if not I, if I had the Minister for Communication right, even though she's not sitting in the chair, that it was just providing an asphalt for every vehicle to be able to pass on, whether it is an articulator or a Kia or a, a taxi, so that it's just a provision of asphalted road that will be assessed by everybody. Chairman, my recollection is that the Central Digital Transmission Company Limited is not a regulator. It's a transmission service company where companies that are authorized plug in and transmit their content through their equipment. So you are not sure whether it's a, <clears throat> it's a public entity or a private entity? You could answer Chairman, that I have clearly. answered earlier by suggesting that my recollection of the type of entity is not clear. I do not recall uh, what type of entity it was. What I recall was to do with the issues of the board constitution which uh, I made representations, and which and other matters are still residual matters that we expect. Mr. Chairman, sure. if you were sending reps to a board, I thought it's only fair that you should be interested in knowing which board you are sending your representative well, on. Chairman, we were not sending reps to the board. We were having a, compos a conversation about the composition of the board of the company, and we made representations to that effect of what we think the board of the company ought to look like and who should be on the board. That is the furthest that we went on that conversation. And when, when this company is also going to include some of the state-owned media passing through it, wouldn't you be worried to find out what kind of board it was going to be? Well, Chairman, as I've mentioned in our consultations, we're not at that stage yet. We're talking about who ought to be on this board when it is created. And those were the representations that we were going through. Because if it was going to involve state-owned, State or media, I mean, as a member of parliament, as minister of state, as a media practitioner yourself, you want to be saying that, oh, then let's refer to the act that established it. So that we can see what the act says, who and who should be on it. But once we are proposing persons on the rate, there's no any legislative, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, there's no any existing law or uh, instrument that was guiding that. Obviously, you should be worried as a minister. Yes, of Chairman, that's why, that is why I've said that there are residual matters that need to be dealt with on that particular project. And my understanding is that it has not been completed. And, for example, these concerns that the Honorable Member raises, I believe, can all be accommodated in the conversations that will ensue. 
Would you say that, even though this was asked earlier about the absence of National Media Commission being on that uh, board, will you say that such, an, com, such a company, organization, or agency should rather be operating under the National Media Commission? No, Chairman, I would not say you should be operating under the National Media Commission. No, I haven't said you said. I'm saying that I'm of the view that if it's going to be providing uh, access for television channels and what have you, because of our constitutional structure, this should rather be under National Media Commission. Yes, and Chairman, I'm saying that I do not share that view. I believe that the National Media Commission must have a role to play. I have made representations on how I think that should be structured. Or let me say my ministry has made representations. We are in the process of having those uh, conversations on those residual matters. I don't think we should prejudice it uh, by trying to resolve it here on this floor. As I mentioned, with your leave, if I do get into that office, I believe we can deal with those residual matters. Mr. Chairman, I, will you be surprised if I show you the profile of the uh, Central Digital Transmission Company Limited? And on their registered profile, it shows that they were going to be a private entity. Will you be surprised? That they were going to they were registered. Private, they were registered to, to partake a private activity. Well, Chairman, as I've mentioned, the knowledge as I have of this matter is the discussions that are ongoing. If there's any additional information, if it's made available to me, I believe that we can factor it into the residual conversations. If after you leave here, you confirm that this is a private entity, will you advise a private entity to be doing this that involves state-owned media and other? property or, or yeah, other property that are uh, state-owned. Chairman, uh, I think like the expression goes, we'll cross that bridge when we get there. When we are seized with all the rationalization and the reasons for whatever proposals this may be, we'll have an opportunity to have a discussion on it. Well, Honorable Nomni, do you own any media house in Ghana? Yes, or, I do. What's the name? I own um, ABC Communications Limited, or I'm a shareholder in ABC Communications Limited that operates a radio station in Achimoda. What of uh, MX24? MX24. That will be a television station. Yeah, is it, is it yours or do you have a share in it? No, I do not have shares in it. Did you apply in last parliament for uh, members holding profits? Of yes, I did. You and did. was certified as such. So you, you did yes. just to be sure, be sure that you can carry out your business uh, activities. Absolutely. Only the chairman, just there. Have you declared your assets as required under the 1992 constitution? Yes, I have on the assumption of office thank and you. upon the exit of office. All right, thank you. So, Mr. Nomni, Mr. Chairman, so in that case, you are both a policy maker and over, your oversight and you are also a participant in the media, in the media arena. Um, when you say participant, you mean as a shareholder? Yes. Well, yes, to that extent, yes, I'm a shareholder. So you are both uh, a policymaker and somebody who oversights, and you are also a participant. Well, as I've explained, to the extent that I'm a shareholder, I'm one of the shareholders, you can say so. Mr. Chairman, I just want to find out the television station, when was the frequency issued? When was the frequency issued? The frequency for the television MX24 issued? I, I would not know. But is it when you were a minister for, communication, uh, minister for information? I would not know. I am not a shareholder of that company. I would not know. You are not a shareholder in the no. MX24? No, no. Mr. Chairman, during the COVID, and it's uh, reported since the outbreak, I mean, government extended, has government extended any financial assistance to any media houses that you know? Chairman, no, not that I'm aware of. I have made representations that where funding is available and is possible, um, we should support the media uh, because one, the media has been taking a lot of risks uh, going out there interviewing people, 
associated with COVID in these risky times. And two, COVID and the economic slowdowns also affected uh, how the media business is operating. Uh, I am advised that as resources improve and as we continue to support various sectors of the economy, that will be considered. Mr. Chairman, in an answer to an earlier question about the presidential tax force, you said that you were not privy to the nitty gritties of the agreement. Is that what? Is that understanding? I've never guess? used the word nitty gritties here, Chairman. I have not said so. You said you are not uh, you are not privy to the details. Is that what you said? I have not said so. I have explained my participation at the task force, the instruction to the Ghana Airport Company Limited what they did and the detail that they brought back to the task force. And I have suggested that the transport minister uh, may be in a position to provide any further details that this committee may be looking But for. you don't have any details on, on the agreement, do you? No, I do not have details on the agreement. And since the issue became topical, people talking about it, I mean, the minority then issued a press statement and a press conference. You never find it necessary to, to find the details as information minister? The, the brief as I have is sufficient to me. If there are any specific details that uh, I may be required to look for, maybe if you ask of some specific detail that ordinarily I should have, maybe I can answer you on that one. Uh, when the company, the Frontier uh, Health Service Limited was registered in Ghana, do you have that information? No. And about, whether about, they have operated in the company was registered in Ghana? Yes. And Whether they have the... operated any laboratory in Ghana? No, because they are not details that in the ordinary course of my work it will come to my attention or that uh, are required to be known at this point in time. I have not heard so far any claims, for example, that the procurement was done out of order or that there's anything questionable about this organization to arouse my interest in going fishing. But um, honorable for that. Um, nominee, you are a lawyer. You said so. In an ordinary agreement, would those details be contained in any such agreement? I'm not even sure, Chairman, if the recitals will be in that agreement. It's not like I mean, even if it will be in the recitals of that agreement, I'm not sure. Well, Mr. Chairman, the interesting thing is that when issues come up from any government sector, normally here you, you come out, you articulate, and you try to get the final details to be able to feed the public about their doubts, about what the facts are. But I'm surprised that when it came to this frontier health services, most of the questions that have been asked, the, the procurement method that was used, who are the owners, do they operate in a laboratory, how are they operating at the airport? What, how did they arrive at their charges? We don't find it necessary to acquire this information and be able to educate the public. Educate the public, Chairman, on when the company was incorporated, etc., may not necessarily be what I would desire to do. The biggest thing I've heard, which I think has warranted uh, my attention and my curiosity, has been on the cost of the testing, about $150 uh, initially, and then now uh, cut down to $50 for Ghanaian and ECOWAS uh, citizens. I have inquired about why. I'm told that that is the uh, agreed price between the Airport Company Limited and the private service provider who was providing it. But beyond that, I mean, leader, with respect, issues of date of incorporation, etc., will not ordinarily fit in my line of work. Mr. Chairman, an earlier answer to a question about whether the it's not very clear. The, the company that you own is in, is in your CV, yeah, where you are the managing director. Managing director, West Brownstone Capital. Is that, a, is that the name? In an earlier answer, you said that they didn't have any liability, outstanding liability, with uh, over microfinance. No. Is that what you said? Yes. Is that for a fact? Because yes. you're under oath? Yes. Well, there's a information from Bank of Ghana that indicated that they have their, their outstanding of 212 
212,751 point something. Is, is it accurate? No, I would contest that. And I would uh, believe that if this is information that um, uh, you desire to verify, I'm sure the Bank of Ghana can verify whether this is true or not. But you are also a majority shareholder in the over microfinance. Yes, that's what I referred to. My company and, was a shareholder in it. And did you borrow from Unibank? Did I do what? Did you, yes, the operations of the over microfinance. Did I borrow from over microfinance? Over microfinance, borrow or took any loan from Unibank or Unisecurity? I would not have the full details on who they took a loan from. But you are you are 82 percent shareholder in there, right? Yes, but there are directors and managers who run the organisation, leader. And if you before that company could take a loan, obviously the directors will have to be in the loan, and you are a director. No shareholder. You are a shareholder. And you are the, the lion shareholder because eighty-two percent. And yes. you think that if they are going for a loan, you will not be you will not be in the loan. Leader, in their ordinary line of business, they used to raise liabilities to create assets. They would not come back to me on every single one of those. Are, are you aware that they have defaulted in payment of their loan that they took from uh, Uni Uni Bank Uni Security? No, I'm not aware. Mr. Chairman, very lastly, in uh, on uh, May, sorry, on 6 April 2020, the dollar, dollar, the DW dollar, they wrote to you about an assault of one. Mr. Yusuf Abdul Ghani, who works for Zuria FM in Kumasi, about an assault from a military lady. And the letter was signed by Christoph Jumper, that's their head of corporate, the head of corporate communications and PR, requesting that the matter be investigated. I don't know whether, did you receive that letter from the I'm not sure. They wrote to me where at the ministry or yes, the personal they, capacity or, or where? Yeah, the, the letter This was, was a hand-delivered letter. The, the letter was dated 6 April 2020. No, about Chairman, an incident that happened on 5th of April 2020. You never received that letter? No, I don't know if there's a stamp from the ministry that says this letter was received from the ministry on that day or on any day. I don't know. this. Mr. Chairman, he said that, so far as he's concerned, Manasseh Azuri did not leave this country because he felt threatened. Is that the impression well, Chairman, that I've not answer that you said? No, I've not said that. I said the information that was available to me was that he reported that his life was under threat. With the help of the National Security Minister, we provided him with a police guard. He subsequently